Uh, hello, Ritish, are you able to uh, hear me clearly? Good afternoon, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, very good. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we have still have about five minutes, so we'll wait till the others join. Are you a student at Ayuka? No, sir. So I'm from uh, Central University, Himachal Pradesh. Okay, good, good. Are you people able to see my screen? Yes, sir. Yeah, let me make sure it's full screen. Yeah, Okay, so I think it's 11.30 and we can begin. Right, uh, so 
welcome to this course uh, it's a 14 lecture course uh, it's called official title is extra galactic astronomy 2 uh, but really the course is all about about agns um, my name is uh, yogesh wardekar i'm a faculty member at at ncr atifr uh, i work uh, partially on agns uh, mostly in the radio uh, but by no means is all my research about AGNs. I also work on, on normal galaxies. So, so I've already set up uh, a website uh, where, uh, uh, which will be used to interact with you uh, for this course. Uh, you may want to just write down the URL that is on your screen. And uh, if you need to contact me for any reason, feel free to email me at this email address, which is given here. And on the website, I will put up the PDF file for each lecture uh, as soon as it's given. So you don't have to bother copying down stuff that is already on the uh, slide. So pay attention to the content of the slide. Don't. Uh, uh, spend time trying to uh, copy figures or uh, uh, trying to uh, copy the text. Uh, the website is already active, so you can uh, go take a look at look at it. And uh, I'm also going to be recording uh, each of my talks because I thought that given the whole uncertain situation right now, in case any of you misses a lecture, uh, you'll be able to go to the uh, recording of, of the lecture and uh, take a look. Uh, the recording is being done on the cloud, so it will take a couple of days for me to uh, get the recording and put the recording link uh, on the on the web page, uh, but it, it'll, it'll, uh, it'll be there. Okay, so before we get started, I would just like to do one round of, of introductions, uh, just stating your name, uh, where you are from, okay, uh, and where you did your previous degree, uh, very likely a master's degree. Uh, in some cases, a four-year BTEC is possible. And whether you are a student of Ayuka NCRA or uh, one of the universities. So, uh, the way to handle it, I think what I should do is uh, there are 15 participants. I'll just call upon you one by one and uh, so that we don't get too many people talking at the same time uh, in the order that I see it on my screen. Okay. So the first name I see is uh, uh, Vishwanath Malakar. Uh, so can you unmute yourself and just introduce yourself quickly? Hello, sir. I'm Vishnath Malaka. I'm from Ayuka. You are from Ayuka. Okay. And where did you do your, do your previous degree? Yes, I did my MSc from IIT Kharagpur and BSc from Kallan University, okay. West Bengal. Okay. Right. Okay. So the next uh, name I see is Ishita Banerjee. Hello, sir. Uh, I'm from Bengal. And yeah. I also in Ayuka. Okay. And uh, I did my MSc from KGP, IIT KGP. And hmm. from my BS, I did my BSc from Bengal as well, Calcutta University. Okay, right. So you have a, a similar profile to uh, Vishwanath. Okay. Next name I see is uh, Janmejay Sarkar. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. I'm from uh, Siliguri in West Bengal. I uh, I did my master's from Tezpur University in Assam and my bachelor's from North Bengal University, Assam. Okay. Uh, North Bengal University in West Bengal. And uh, I'm doing my PhD at Tezpur University in Assam now. Okay. So, so you are a university uh, student? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, I've been to Tezpur many years ago. I'd like to go there again, hopefully, uh, hopefully soon. Okay. Uh, next name I see is Manish. Uh, hello, sir. Hmm. Sir, I have done my B.Tech from Delhi College of Engineering. Okay. 
and i am from delhi okay. as well okay and uh, so you uh, uh, so you've done a four year course so you you're allowed to direct are you doing an integrated uh, course here or no no i'm i'm allowed in full time phd full time phd okay right and you are at ayuka now yes okay right manish uh, the next uh, name i see is uh, pushpak pande so pushpak hello sir yeah yes sir i am from odisha and uh, i have done my integrated msc from uh, nizer bhuneshwar okay. and sir uh, i am a iq student i am phd yes so you have finished your uh, integrated msc from nizer yes sir. okay great okay so pushpak next name i see uh, is rahul hello sir this is uh, rahul sharan huh? i am currently in ncra okay uh, i got my bsms from aizer kolkata okay and where are you originally from what's your hometown uh hometown is in uh, my parents are staying in burgapur which is in west bengal but yes. i'm currently uh, i'm from uh, bihar okay. now uh, next name i see is rajendra prasad bhat yes hello sir my name is rajendra prasad bhat i am from kaledungi which is in nainital district of uttarakhand okay and i did my msc from iit kharagpur west bengal and i am i am a student of ayuka ayuka okay right next name is ramananda hello yes uh, my name is ramananda satya and i am an integrated phd student at ncra yes i am from west bengal so i did my bsc from vidyasagar university west bengal okay and you you did your masters uh, here right no actually i am integrated phd so yes so you I, you uh, yeah i mean you did your coursework in the pune university yeah pune university yes okay great raman okay now the next name i see is ritish bharadwaj uh, ritish uh, uh, can you please unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself hello good afternoon sir yeah uh, so myself ritish kumar i am from himachal pradesh hmm. uh, i have done my masters from himachal pradesh university shimla mm -hmm. and presently i'm doing my i'm a phd student at central university himachal pradesh okay where is the central university uh, in himachal pradesh located which town So it's located in uh, Kangra Dharmshala. Okay, so Kangra. Yes, sir. All right. Okay. We finished with Ritish. Uh, Shayok Datta. Uh, hello, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Shayok. Uh, I'm from Bengal. I've done my masters from IIT Guwahati, and I'm right now in Ayuka, PhD student. Okay. right okay. next name i see soham day soham i know of course but anyway you should introduce yourself hello sir uh, i am from west bengal hmm. i am uh, i am a integrated phd student in ncra and i have done my bsc from st xavier's college kolkata okay st xavier's okay uh, uh, i see uh, shomil molik Hi sir, Samir. I'm yeah. from Pune. Uh, I did my masters from Bitswa. I'm currently a PhD student at IU. IU. So uh, uh, Bits does it has some kind of integrated masters or? Uh... Yes, it's similar to that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. Great. Okay. So. Uh... Next name I see is Swar uh, Swarnim Shirke. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm Swarnim Shirke. I'm from Pune. I did my masters from IIT Bombay, okay. and I'm a student of Ayuka. Okay. Okay. Right. 
right uh, last name is yash hello sir uh, i am from maharashtra i am currently at ncra and i did my btech from iit madras okay yeah i think uh, were you in engineering physics yes sir okay great good so have i missed out anyone because i just went in the order that i saw uh, is there anyone here who hasn't introduced themselves yet please unmute and speak uh, otherwise we'll continue okay so right uh, so here is how your assessment for this course will be done uh, we will have two assignments uh, which will have about 60 which will have 60% weightage i'll give you the first assignment more or less at the end of the third week and the second assignment at the end of the uh, sixth week and uh, you will have about two and a half weeks time to complete each assignment uh, in addition so this will each assignment will have a 30% weightage equal weightage for both the assignments uh, then we are going to have a 30% weightage uh, for an online seminar uh, towards the end of the course so i'll tell you in a minute what the seminar will be all about uh, but that's going to have 30% weightage i uh, will have about 10% weightage for class participation okay, and this is with regard to i'll ask you some questions uh, during the my talks and you have to answer them uh, but you can also ask me questions uh, about what i'm talking about so that will have 10% weightage usually this kind of uh, uh, weightage works very well uh, for uh, in 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 person classes i am not sure how it is going to work online so if it doesn't work out and if i feel that it's becoming very very complicated for me to uh, uh, give you due credit for this uh, we will just skip it so that's why i've kept a very low weightage to that and if that happens i will just scale up your marks uh, in the assignments and the seminars to make it uh, out of 100 okay so uh, assignments gain you the majority of marks so please spend enough time on them uh, some assignment problems will require some small amount of computer scripting writing code and also some use of some plotting software to make uh, plots okay so please make sure you are comfortable with some basic computer programming uh, this is a good time to learn if you have not learned computer programming so far because later on in your phd uh, you will certainly need some kind of uh, computer programming whatever you do uh, i strongly recommend uh, python uh, for your programming it's a relatively simple language to learn even if you are good at programming in other language i would still say that you consider learning python because it's a very simple language uh, to learn Uh, particularly if you know programming in fortran or c or some other language uh, i within python i recommend the numpy module for fast array computations and the matplotlib for a module for plotting these are standard modules from within python you will anyway be using them uh, if you are doing any serious uh, numerical programming okay so now about the seminar the purpose of the seminar is to pick one seminal paper in the field of active galactic nuclei which you will be expected to explain to the rest of us in about 20 minutes and each one of us uh, each one of you will speak about a different paper so what i will do is i very soon i will provide a list of papers uh, to choose from <coughs> on the course website uh you can i'll provide links to those papers also so please go through those papers uh, browse through them and try and identify uh the papers that you like so uh, since we have about 16 17 participants uh in this course uh i will put up a slightly longer list i'll put up maybe 25 to 30 papers uh, so that there's no real conflict usually there is no conflict 
but if there is, we'll uh, have to work out a way by of resolving it, uh, possibly by adding uh, some papers that are very similar to the paper that is being uh, sought after by multiple people. Okay. <clears throat> The seminars will be held towards the end of the course. So uh, we, we will need almost a full day for the seminars. Uh, so we, uh, so, so please keep that in mind, but there's no final exam or in any midterm exam. So you don't have to worry about exams. This seminar is the only thing that you will have to uh, prepare for. So, uh, Here's the official uh, syllabus for this course. Uh, it starts off with phenomenology of various kinds of active galactic nuclei, uh, Seifert galaxies, uh, quasars, uh, radio galaxies, liners, BLX, etc. And with a broad survey of continuum emission and absorption features of uh, the spectra of, of the AGN. The spectra of AGN, it turns out, are very rich in the ultraviolet and optical bands, and less so uh, in the uh, less rich in lines in the other bands. Uh, so we we our analysis will focus on on uh, mostly on the UV and uh, optical spectra. Then a little bit about what powers the AGN, the black hole and the accretion disk models for AGN. Uh, and then what happens in the regions immediately surrounding the black hole, which are these so-called emission line regions, which come in two flavors, broad line regions and narrow line regions, BLR and NLRs for shorts. And then about the transport of energy from the central engine outwards into the ISM and into the IGM, uh, which is uh, primarily happens through, uh, through jets and uh, these large radio lobes. Uh, so the physics of jets and hotspots uh, will also be part of this course. So I will cover uh, all of these topics, but I will also go a little bit beyond to talk about the connection between uh, AG, the AGN phenomenon and uh, galaxy evolution, because that, that is a very active area of research today. And I thought I should devote some attention to, uh, to that topic. Uh, I will naturally focus more on areas that are being worked upon at NCRA and Ayuka. Uh, but the nature of this course is, <clears throat> one must remember, is largely phenomenological. It is it's a, going to be a fairly uh, descriptive course. But I will try to, from time to time, give you uh, the big picture so that you are not lost in the details. So what are the connections to other astronomy courses you have taken uh, or other courses you have taken in the graduate school? Oh, there are obviously connections to uh, galaxies, uh, electrodynamics and radiative processes. I think one in uh, the first course that you took, which talked about various kinds of thermal and non-thermal uh, radiative uh, mechanisms, uh, those will uh, all be important for, for the AGN phenomenon. <clears throat> uh, of course, uh, GR and SR are important. I will not be focusing too much on, uh, on, the, uh, on the GR aspects of, of AGN uh, for two reasons. One is that you're expected to have covered some of these things in your GR course. And also, I am not a great expert on GR. Uh, but of course, SR will figure because there are things phenomena like superluminal motion in AGN jets, uh, where uh, SR uh, special relativity comes into the picture. So I will talk uh, a bit about that. Uh, there is obviously going to be a connection between the course that you are taking right now on the interstellar medium and the intergalactic medium. So watch out for connections between what I say and what is you are learning uh, simultaneously in that course. Uh, radio AGN are, uh, I mean, the radio band is a very important band for studying uh, uh, AGN, and therefore radio techniques, which again you are you are learning about uh, simultaneously with this course, will uh, also come into the picture when we talk about uh, 
uh, imaging of extended sources, the giant radio galaxies and so on. <clears throat> textbooks and reference material. I will put up, I have put up in fact, the list of some textbooks. Uh, I will also add some review articles on the website so that uh, you're able to uh, sort of get the big picture. Uh, what I found was very interestingly that uh, when I looked up the list of textbooks that are being uh, used currently, uh, I found that many of those textbooks are from 20, 25 years ago when I was a PhD student. So there hasn't been much, uh, very many new textbooks that have been written in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, however, there are a large number of uh, review articles because there are a large number of papers that have been written about AGN and uh, uh, therefore there are a large number of review articles uh, that have been written. So we, there will be links to those also on the website. I'm putting in a fair bit of effort to make uh, slides for these talks. So please use these as your starting point. And remember to stop me and ask questions if you don't understand something at uh, some point. Okay, don't wait till the end of the lecture. I must also say that there are many aspects of AGN that I have uh, never worked on. So uh, I'm also sort of learning along with you. Uh, so hopefully, so if I can't give you an answer to a question immediately, uh, I will definitely research it and get back to you in the next class. Uh, some of the slides that I will show you will uh, cite papers which you are encouraged to read uh, to know more. And uh, this could be quite important for this course because as I said, there has there's a lot of papers, research papers uh, that have been written in the last uh, 60 years of Asian studies. And uh, the literature is really, really very vast. So uh, you may have to do some reading of those papers as well. Uh, again, uh, just to reiterate, don't the I've written, I've listed already about five or six textbooks. Uh, these are large textbooks. Together, they're probably about uh, fifteen hundred pages or so. You're obviously not expected to read all of those. So use them as reference material because we this is a short course. It's a 14 lecture course. A full course on AGN can be 40, 45 lectures. So uh, we are not going to do that. We are just going to do a quick overview. So read, read in parts that you don't understand or you uh, need more clarity. And of course, if you in the future, if you decide to do your PhD uh, on in this field, then of course you will need to read uh, a lot of textbooks and review articles. <clears throat> so are there any questions about how the course is organized and the course content? If you have any questions, please unmute yourself. Okay, so I assume there are no questions. Again, of course, at any point, if you uh, have any doubts, uh, you can ask me during the lecture or just send me an email and I'll answer your question. Okay, so let's begin. So if you look at the light from a normal galaxy, by normal galaxy, I mean a galaxy that does not ho host uh, active galactic nucleus. And if you look at these galaxies in the optical and infrared bands, uh, the light from such normal galaxies will be dominated by the light from stars with smaller contributions coming from gas, uh, usually from ionized gas and from dust. And the contribution from dust is mainly coming uh, due to absorption. The radiation from stars, as you know, is largely thermal. Uh, the emission from stars can be well modeled by uh, a black body function by the Planck spectrum. Uh, whereas the spectrum of a galaxy 
is therefore described very well by the linear superposition of many billions of black body spectra, okay, uh, with temperatures spanning about a dex. So if you take the coolest star, the surface temperature of the coolest star and the surface temperature of the hottest star that can exist, uh, it uh, spans one order of magnitude, not more than that. And so what you will have as a spectrum of a galaxy will be the superposition of many, many, many uh, stars at different uh, temperatures, each with its own uh, slightly different uh, black body spectrum. The spectrum of the galaxy is, of course, modulated by dust. So what dust tends to do is that it tends to absorb uh, the radiation, particularly the higher energy radiation like the UV radiation. And it tends to get heated by that, by absorbing the photons. And then it tends to re-emit uh, that radiation and mostly in the infrared. But if you look at AGN, the light from AGN is a mix of both thermal and non-thermal processes. Okay? So this is the key takeaway from this slide, is that unlike galaxies, uh, normal galaxies, where the light is dominated by uh, thermal uh, processes, the source of light in AGN uh, is both thermal and non-thermal in nature. So this is a picture of the optical sky. This is the uh, this is in galactic coordinates. So the disk of the Milky Way is sort of along the, of course, along the galactic equator. And as uh, you can imagine, the light from the in the optical band is dominated by light coming from stars, uh, from ionized gas, and from dust, which is seen mainly in the form of absorption in the op optical. If you want to see dust in emission you have to go to the infrared bands. On the other hand, if you look at the radio sky, uh, which uh, is, is shown here, again, in galactic coordinates, so the brightest part of the radio sky is still the disk of the Milky Way. Uh, but the individual sources uh, come from pulsars, uh, from supernova remnants, from star forming regions within the Milky Way and from galaxies AGN, which are lying outside the Milky Way. So if you can see my cursor, you'd be able to see a galaxy over here. So that's an AGN, okay? uh, most likely uh, Centaurus A. And you can also see at the center of our galaxy, there is a supermassive black hole. Uh, there is a fairly bright radio source over there, uh, which is referred to as Sagittarius A star. Sagittarius because it's in the Sagittarius constellation and A star A because it's the brightest source in the constellation of Sagittarius, brightest radio source. And star indicates that it's a point-like object. It's not resolved. And that's because it's, it's, it's really coming from a region very close to the black hole. So our galaxy, you may think is in, therefore an AGN, but it's not because the black hole that is sitting at the center of our galaxy is at the moment quiescent. It's not doing anything. It's just sitting there quietly. But at some point in the future, uh, it may get activated and it may turn into an AGN. And it is also believed that at some points at numerous times in the past, the Milky Way galaxy was an AGN. Okay, so now the study of AGN uh, began in earnest with the discovery of radio sources, bright radio sources in the sky, a number of which turned out to be AGN. So what is shown here now in equatorial coordinates rather than galactic coordinates. So here you can see the the plane of the Milky Way and uh, shown in these uh, red and uh, blue contours are individual uh, radio sources. Okay. So for example, Orion A and B are uh, 
a star forming region. Uh, this one is the Crab Nebula in Taurus, which is a supernova remnant. And, uh, but you also have a few AGN here. Centaurus A is an AGN. Sagittarius A star, as we already saw, is, is some kind of quiescent AGN. Cygnus A uh, that you see here uh, is an AGN and so on. Okay, there are a few of the other objects. Cassiopeia A is a supernova remnant. It's not an AGN. So uh, M87, which you see here uh, at top right corner is also an AGN. So clearly if you take, make a list of let's say the 10, 20 brightest radio sources in the sky, about four, five, or six of them will turn out to be uh, AGN. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, do the contour lines over there represent the flux density in radio band? Yes. So these are uh, represent the flux density uh, in the radio band. And what is actually shown here in parenthesis is the flux of the radio source in Jansky. So, for example, in Cygnus A, you will see uh, it's 3C designation. That's a number in a catalog. And 1495 indicates that it's a 1495 Jansky source. Okay. And that makes it a really, really bright source. Similarly, Sagittarius A is 1800 Jansky. These are very, very bright sources. Uh, the dominant, other than the sun, these are amongst the brightest sources in the radio sky. Uh, sir, uh, yeah. another thing is that, so like you said the term radio sky, so when we see radio sky, which uh, wave band or which wavelength band do we consider? Yes, so uh, uh, most of uh, what, uh, when I talk about the radio, so when I talk in detail about the radio AGN, I will of course describe that, but when I say radio band, I'm primarily uh, meaning uh, frequencies between say about 150 megahertz to about 10 gigahertz. Okay, this is what oh. I normally mean because if you go to higher frequencies, uh, there also that goes into what is called as the, that is usually referred to as the submillimeter and the millimeter bands. Okay, which goes into many hundreds of uh, gigahertz. But we will, the classical radio bands are between 150 megahertz to about 10, 15 gigahertz. And the GMRT telescope, for example, is covers a subset of this radio band. It goes from about 150 megahertz to about 1.5 gigahertz. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, so what are AGN? So very simply, AGN are galaxies that have a strong emission component uh, emanating from their nuclear region. So there is a lot of light that is coming from their nuclear regions. This additional component is now universally accepted to be caused by an actively accreting central supermassive black hole. Okay, And how massive will, can that black hole be? It's usually more than 10 raised to 6 uh, solar masses. Uh, the mass of the supermassive black hole, this, this is a typo here, it should be six times 10 raised to 10 uh, solar masses. So that, that's the mass of the most massive supermassive black hole known. So very roughly, I mean, if you would just want a ballpark figure to remember, uh, remember that the masses of supermassive black holes are between 10 raised to six uh, to 10 raised to nine solar masses. The higher solar mass, uh, the higher mass black holes uh, have not been confirmed. Their mass measurements are, are not very robust. So you should take those measurements with a pinch of salt. AGN have very high luminosities. Uh, bolometric luminosities can go up to uh, 10 raised to 48 Earths per second, uh, which means that AGN can, the most luminous AGN, can easily outshine an entire galaxy. Okay. As we shall see, this is very remarkable because the volume of that contains the AGN is a very, very tiny fraction of the total volume of a galaxy. So one is seeing light equivalent to a whole galaxy coming from a very tiny volume. 
these emitting regions are very small in most bands. So except for the radio band where you see very, very extended manifestations of, of the active galactic nucleus. In most cases, what you see as emission in most of the other bands like the optical band or the X-ray band, the emission that you uh, see from AGN is coming from a very, very tiny region of the order of a milliparsec. We know by studying AGN at different redshifts that there is strong evolution of the luminosity functions uh, of the AGN uh, with time. Uh, so this is a very important uh, consideration because we know that, for example, that about five giga years, six giga years, 10 giga years in the past, uh, the uh, very large fraction of galaxies hosted uh, AGN uh, so that is referred to as the star forming epoch and also as the EGN epoch because a lot of star formation was happening and there were many AGNs that were providing feedback uh, in the universe. We don't have so many AGN now in the local universe. So that there is evidence for very strong evolution of the luminosity function. Uh, the broadband emission from AGN covers the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So that is quite remarkable that uh, you can see very often the same object can be detected uh, all the way from gamma rays to the radio and all intermediate bands like the infrared, the optical, uh, the ultraviolet and so on. So that makes AGN uh, a very, very uh, interesting field of study because you can study AGN with a large variety of telescopes. But what that leads to, because these AGN can be detected and studied at all wavelengths, at all wave bands, the same AGN may receive multiple classifications. So the same object may be called by different names uh, by say X-ray astronomers and radio astronomers. So these listed here in this table are the main classes of AGN. Okay, then one must remember here that these are just the sort of broad classes as we understand them today. Uh, there are many subclasses within the, within the AGN. Okay, so for example, uh, uh, amongst quasars, there is a large pop population that has been detected now or uh, that has been identified using their optical properties. In the old days, quasars referred to as strictly to quasi-stellar radio source. And now many quasars, in fact, 90% of quasars are, are quite quiet in the radio. You need very, very sensitive radio observations to even detect them. Uh, there are, of course, large uh, number of quasars, uh, but a small fraction, about 10%, which are what are called radio loud, uh, which can be detected uh, in the radio uh, quite easily. Uh, there are Seifert 1 and Seifert 2 galaxies. Uh, there are quasi-stellar uh, non-quasar-like objects. QSOs is what they're referred to uh, in the literature. Uh, these are non-radio sources. And... Uh, then there are uh, radio quiet AGNs and radio loud AGNs, AGNs with strong relativistic jets uh, and non-jetted AGNs uh, without any strong relativistic jets. Uh, there are different classes of radio galaxies, uh, Fanner of Riley class one and Fanner of Riley class two. And then there are beamed objects, uh, BLAX and blazars. Uh, where uh, relativistic beaming leads to uh, uh, the observe uh, leads to rapid changes in the flux uh, that we observe from these objects. So these are seemingly very very different objects, but as one shall see later on in this course, there is a unification model uh, which works reasonably well in uh, and gives us an opportunity to think of all of these objects uh, in the AGN zoo as different manifestations of the same underlying physical phenomenon. Okay, Sir? yeah, go ahead. Uh, 
when we are saying agn are we referring to the to the emitting nuclear part or to the entire galaxy uh for most of the scores when i say agn uh it will refer to the the central uh, regions only right but i mean if you say a uh, galaxy is an agn that word is i mean that phraseology is often used there you say it mean there you take it to mean the whole galaxy so because the impact of the agn uh, is felt uh, maximally only in the central regions we will talk mostly about the central regions but in some cases especially when we go to uh, impact of uh, uh, agn on galaxy evolution there we will have to consider the whole whole galaxy as the agn yeah okay so a bit uh, through the history of agn i'm not going to talk too much about the history but it's useful to give a quick introduction so as early as 1908 when the first spectrographs were being used to obtain spectra of galaxies uh, people like slifer uh, and others had found that there is there are very tiny number of galaxies <clears throat> which seem to sh show uh, strong emission lines in their spectrum normally if you take the a normal galaxy which is as we saw a superposition of many many stellar spectra uh so stellar spectra of the sun for example will not show emission lines it will show lots of absorption lines primarily from from the various uh hydrogen transitions of the hydrogen atom uh which we know as fraunhofer lines in the solar spectrum so these are absorption lines so normally for most normal galaxies you don't see emission lines you see only absorption lines but what was found by slifer and collaborators uh is that there are a few galaxies that show uh absorption sorry emission lines and these emission lines strangely enough would be coming only from the nuclear regions of the galaxy these kind of strong emission lines were not seen from the outer parts of the galaxy only from the central regions and that too for a very small fraction of galaxies uh you could see these kind of uh, strong emission lines of course this matter was not uh, studied in any great detail uh until the 1940s uh when uh, carl seifert uh, uh who was an astronomer uh went and studied systematically uh went looking for these galaxies with strong emission lines and uh, studied their spectra and so therefore in his honor these kind of galaxies are called seifert galaxies today uh carl seifert uh, found that these kind of galaxies were invariably hosted uh, by spiral galaxies so uh, these were not sitting in ellipticals but these were sitting in spiral galaxies and he had to search through about 100 galaxies before he found one galaxy which showed emission lines so he was able to show that yes uh, many uh, spiral galaxies or uh, 1% of spiral galaxies uh, show uh, emission lines uh, of this nature uh, in addition to these broad emission lines there were also narrow emission lines so as you can see uh, over here there's a very broad emission line uh, and over here there is a fairly narrow emission line so there were in addition to broad emission lines there were also narrow emission lines and these were invariably characterized by a very blue continuum in the ultraviolet so if you look at the continuum you can see that as you go below 4000 angstroms uh, uh, shorter wavelengths we, the flux goes on increasing the continuum flux goes on increasing and uh, this is also pretty unusual because most galaxies don't show a spectrum like that most uh, galaxies will show a slope in the opposite direction 
where their UV flux uh, will be considerably lower than say their U band or B band flux. This was not seen in most of the AGNs that Seifert studied. So he classified these uh, AGNs as peculiar objects. But again, nobody went into the details of trying to explain the, the physics of this. Until the late 1950s, when uh, Ludwig Volcher wrote a very interesting uh, paper where he tried to analyze the physics of, uh, of the Seifert uh, phenomenon. Uh, one thing he knew was that these nuclei were unresolved, even with the best telescopes. So the size of the nucleus must be less than about 100 parsec in size. So these strong emission lines, etc., were coming from a region which was less than 100 parsecs in diameter. He could also conclude that the nuclear emission must last more than 10 raised to 8 years because Seifert galaxies were known to constitute about 1 in 100 spiral galaxies. So one extreme scenario was that galaxies which are Seiferts ones are always Seiferts in which their case their lifetime will be the age of the universe 10 raised to 10 years. The You can take the opposite extreme is that all spirals pass through a Seifert phase or multiple phases. But since one spiral in 100 is currently in the Seifert phase, it must have a duty cycle of 1 in 100. So therefore, it must last of the order of uh, 10 raised to 10 uh, over 100, 10 raised to 8 years. Okay? So that was the, the idea that uh, you must have something, even if it recurs, uh, it, it should have lifetime that is of order of uh, 10 raised to 8 years. Right. But there in lies a problem. So, because if the material in the nucleus is gravitationally bound, uh, then you can use the virial theorem to compute the mass of the nucleus. Right. And uh, which will be basically V square R over G where V uh, is measured by the width of the emission lines that you see coming from the nucleus, right? And uh, R, of course, is the region uh, from which the emission is coming. So that much mass must be sitting inside that volume. Velocity dispersion uh, is of the order of 1000 kilometers per second. This was measured from the the spectra of Seifert galaxies uh, that were obtained. We know from, from the fact that the nucleus is unresolved that it can't be bigger than 100 parsec because if it were, we would be able to resolve it. The emission lines were characteristic of a low density gas, which effectively provides a lower limit of one parsec. Now this was what was written in this 1959 paper. So this is not strictly correct because as we know today, the size of the AGN is really, really much smaller than a parsec uh, in most of the cases. Uh, so it is possible to have low density gas. Okay. Why, why do we need low density gas? Uh, any ideas? Why can't you see emission lines from high density gas? Okay, Hello, sir. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Sir, in the low density gas, uh, uh, in the high density gas, the emission lines which will be originating from the gas will be reabsorbed due to very high optical depth. But in case of low density gas, it will be able to escape from the gas, I guess. Yes, that is absolutely right. So in the optical depth uh, of high density gas is sufficiently high that even if emission happens, it gets absorbed. Okay. 
because the optical depth is very high. That is why we cannot see emission lines on the solar spectrum because there are definitely emission being produced, uh, transition happening in the inner parts of the sun, but uh, because the optical depth is high, you cannot penetrate, you cannot see those, those atoms uh, transitioning. So therefore, you only see absorption lines which are coming from the outer cooler layers of the stellar atmospheres. And the same phenomenon is expected to happen here. The fact that you see uh, strong emission lines which are reaching to up to you indicates that they must be coming from a low optical depth uh, region of the AGN. Okay, um, right. So now if you plug in using the virial theorem, the, the radius to be either one parsec or 100 parsec, uh, put in that as the value of R, and put in 1000 kilometers per second as the value of uh, V in this uh, virial equation, uh, V square R over G, you will get a mass of 10 raised to nine uh, plus minus one solar masses for the mass that is sitting within that uh, one parsec or 100 parsec region. So why do you think this poses a problem? Um, hello, sir. Yeah. Sir, I guess this is a problem because in the in our galaxy, we said uh, we see the stars which are basically one parsec apart. Yes. So in the one parsec region, there could be only one star. But if we are saying that the emitting region is of the scale of one parsec, yeah. but it is having the mass of uh, 10 to the power 10 stars, which is uh, not usual. Correct. Yes. It is very difficult to think of stars that are stable. See, remember, you it's not just enough to put stars, uh, 10 raised to 8 stars uh, into that volume. Okay, They also have to last for 10 raised to 8 years. Right? They cannot disrupt each other. They cannot merge with each other. Nothing. So that is poses a problem. So the size packing in so many things can be a problem. What, what if I say it's not one parsec, it is 100 parsec, then you have a much larger volume to work with, right? Uh, is that, is, do you think that would be feasible to pack everything into 100 parsec? Anyone else other than Manish, any thoughts? Can you put... So now how many, how much mass do you need to put? Remember your R has increased. So instead of one, it is hundred. So M is also going to become hundred times larger. So it is going to go like 10 raised to 10. Is there a problem putting 10 raised to 10 solar masses in uh, uh, within hundred parsec? What is, what is the typical stellar mass of a galaxy? How many stars does it uh, contain? It's almost like mass of galaxy. Yes, of yes. It's almost like even if you take a big galaxy like Milky Way, which is 10 raised to 11 uh, stars, right? You are saying you are going to pack the mass of 10% of the stars uh, within, a, uh, within that volume. That seems like a problem. Okay, so obviously uh, it became clear that there has to, this has to be resolved in some way. Okay, could this be a, a completely different phenomenon? We are not packing in stars, but we are packing in something else. Now, soon after this paper was written, uh, we had the discovery of quasars. Uh, by this man uh, you see uh, pictured here as an older gentleman, Martin Schmidt. And uh, on the cover of Time when he was quite young uh, many years ago, soon after his discovery of quasars. So what Martin Schmidt was doing was he was using the, the five meter uh, telescope at Palomar and he was obtaining spectra of various objects. And he at that time, the first radio surveys had become available. So there was 
the first Cambridge survey, the second Cambridge survey and so on at, made at Cambridge, England. So the third Cambridge survey came up with a list of radio sources that they had detected uh, in the sky. And then by using the positions of those radio sources, Martin Schmidt first identified uh, each object with a optical source. And for this particular radio source, three, C273, uh, he identified with this uh, star-like object. So he was immediately interested, wow, how can a star emit so much of radio emission? Let me go and check. Since he had access to the biggest optical telescope at that time, uh, he went and obtained a spectrum of this particular star-like object. And that spectrum is shown here. Okay, it's not a very good quality scan because this is from a very old photographic plate. But what he was able to see were various emission lines, right? Uh, which are seen here in black. And then he was, but when he tried to match those emission lines, first of all, he said, why are there so many emission lines rather than absorption lines? And Secondly, he couldn't match the spectrum with the spectrum of any known star. It seemed really odd. Not a single line was matching. And then in a uh, uh, moment of inspiration, he said, oh my God, these might be Doppler shifted lines. And then he went and uh, obtained, uh, he started red shifting those lines uh, or right, started red, red shifting his lab spectrum to match the lines. And then at a redshift of 0 0.16, he suddenly discovered that he's getting a perfect match. And this was a very sensational discovery. And that was uh, the discovery of quasars. And that is why he landed up on the cover of uh, Time magazine. And he found that for the first time that there was an object that was very, very distant uh, because it was very distant and its flux was relatively low. It must be also very luminous. He measured, of course, its radio luminosity, which was very high. He went and measured its optical luminosity, which was also very high. And he uh, the, very soon they obtained measurements at a variety of wave bands. And they found that this object was uh, very, very bright at uh, across all wave bands. Very soon after Martin Schmidt's uh, discovery, it was realized that 3C273 is not a unique object. Uh, there are uh, many, many other sources in the sky which optically appear like a point source, but in the radio, uh, they're fairly bright uh, and they are, so the way quasars were, were discovered, the discovery mechanism was very simple. Find a bright radio source, find uh, positionally its optical counterpart, check whether the optical counterpart uh, is, uh, is star-like, uh, check its color. They very quickly realized that uh, the optical counterpart would invariably be quite blue in color uh, compared to the stars around it. So it looked like a very blue star. Then go and get a spectrum, find its redshift. And so using this sort of technique, uh, many, many uh, quasars were discovered. Uh, of course, uh, in the years to come, people realize that you don't have to have that requirement of a radio source. You can just look at point-like radio source, uh, point-like optical object, star-like optical object, which uh, is very blue in color, and just go and get its spectrum anyway, and uh, you'll discover quasars, which are uh, not necessarily bright in the radio. So those are the so-called QSOs, which we will talk about. Okay, so before we end, I'll just cover one topic and we will stop, uh, which is the setting of the AGN size scale, right? So if you look at AGN, 
uh, how big are they? We already said that uh, AGNs have uh, a supermassive black hole at their center, which is between 10 raised to 6 and 10 raised to 9 solar masses. So what is the Schwarzschild radius of such a black hole? What is the Schwarzschild radius of the sun? Does anyone know? Around two, three meters. Sorry? Around two, three meters. No, no, no. That is too small. It's actually uh, three kilometers. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, three kilometers. So what will be the uh, radius of uh, 10 raised to 6 solar mass uh, black hole, Schwarzschild radius? 3 into 10 to the power 6. Yes, because remember the Schwarzschild radius is given by 2 gm by c square, right? So it's uh, the radius is directly proportional to the mass. So it will be a million times larger. And what about uh, 10 raised to 9 uh, solar mass black hole? 3 into 10 to the power 9. Correct. So that is about 3 billion uh, kilometers. So now if you compare that with, uh, in, in think of this in astronomical units, uh, astronomical unit, remember, is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. It is about 150 million kilometers. So 3 million kilometers will be much smaller than uh, the Earth's Sun distance. And 3 billion kilometers will be about maybe 20 times uh, larger than the Earth's Sun distance. So again, we are talking of sizes that are of the Schwarzschild radius of uh, the uh, AGN at the center, of the black hole at the center of AGNs, is only about the size of the, uh, size of the solar system. It's not very large. Even for the most massive, supermassive black holes, the Schwarzschild radius uh, is of the order of the solar system. Maybe a little bit larger, but not by much. Okay. Uh, so we will stop here. So if there are any questions based on what all I have said today, please ask. Yeah. So the, if there are no questions, we will uh, break now. And we will uh, meet again uh, at 11.30 on Wednesday. Please note that I am going to, I want to try and finish the lectures relatively quickly because I have to attend a couple of conferences in June for which I'll be busy. Uh, so I'm going to try and finish my lectures by the 5th of June. So although this is a 7, uh, 14 lecture course, I'm going to try and finish it uh, in about five weeks instead of the usual uh, seven weeks. So I will see you again on Wednesday at the same time, 11.30. Thank you.